All right. Well, Jess, John, thank you guys for being here. And um, it's really nice to kind of continue this series of workshops. Um, for those of you who are, you know, thinking about applying for a PhD, either, you know, this year or any time in the future, um, I'll, I'll share some slides that um, Tracy and Becky and I have put together. And that basically we, we want to kind of extend the conversation that we started about a month ago. Um, and, you know, we talked about it earlier this week, we met on Monday and talked about, okay, well, what are the things that we really need to kind of emphasize and cover right now based on the timeline. Um, we'll do one more workshop um, and in, in a few weeks, we haven't um, talked about timing yet, but um, that will be a kind of third and final workshop and that'll be okay. So now that you've been accepted to a PhD program or programs, now what? And you know, how do you um, kind of navigate that part of it? And that'll be the last of these three workshops. Um, so this one I, you know, is gonna be kind of a lot of, uh, you know, more kind of nuts and bolts. Um, of the process. And um, unlike the last time, we don't have a designed like breakout room time to kind of field your questions because we're hoping to cover quite a bit. But on that note, what I'd like to um, do is just invite you guys to turn your mics on whenever you have a question or if you feel more comfortable to just put it in the chat and we'll try and kind of cover things as we go. Of course, at the same time, kind of thinking about timeline and trying to get to the end as well, um, but definitely don't be shy. And, you know, we can field questions as we go, especially if there's anything that comes up that's confusing or, or, or anything else that you're concerned about. Does that sound okay? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share these Google slides um, that we've put together. And um, I can probably just skip this first one. Let's see, put it in presenter mode. Okay, so everybody's seeing now this, this slide that's, okay, great. So here's a kind of outline for today. Um, it'll be kind of similar to last time that, you know, Tracy, Becky and I will kind of toggle back and forth in terms of different topics. Um, and um, basically, um, I think we could probably skip introductions for the sake of time since um, we all know each other. So if that's okay, we'll just skip that. Um, and just because there's nobody new um, you know, in, in, in this workshop. Um, and we wanna just you know, kind of briefly come back to that timeline that we talked about before and kind of remind everybody of where we're at in that timeline and maybe where we're going, whether it's for this year's cycle or it's for future year's cycle, that timeline is pretty consistent from year to year. Um, and then the three of us together will kind of go over again in the, in the kind of broad view what it, it applying entails um, and, you know, kind of emphasize some of the, you know, the, the kind of main pieces. And then within that, there's a few pieces that we really want to cover with a little more depth today, and that is GRE scores um, when they're required. And Tracy's going to talk about that. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about financial considerations, both from the perspective of just applying and what it costs to apply uh, in addition to GRE scores if you need them, um, but also from the perspective of actually cost of living and funding your research once you're in the PhD program. Um, and then I'll also talk a little bit about, you know, so if you have you know connected with some potential advisors and you're setting up that first zoom call which is typically how things are working now to chat and see if it's a good you know mutually uh, possibly mutually beneficial relationship um kind of how um uh you know at least some advice about um how you might want to uh, conduct that kind of informal interview and oftentimes i think tracy and becky and i can give some um insights into what potential advisors are kind of looking for in you when they're having those informal first interviews um and then in particular kind of how do you talk about your research or you know like kind of your, your elevator pitch um and then Becky's going to talk about the details of writing a personal statement. And this is a critically important piece of, you know, the package is how, you know, how do you kind of present yourself in written form? And then Tracy's going to talk about getting letters of recommendation. In most programs, it's three letters of recommendation and um, give you some, um, some really good advice for, you know, kind of who to ask, when to ask, how to ask kind of stuff. Um, and then time provided, answer any of the remaining questions that don't get answered along the way. Um, does all that sound okay? And then I think we have, is that, is that Blake that just joined us? Um. I, I'm like, great. Um, so, oh, so yeah. Hi. 
Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. And Blake, I just will mention that I mentioned to John and Jess that we'll do one more workshop in a few weeks from now. We haven't determined the date yet, but that one will be, you know, provided that you get accepted to one or more programs, kind of how do you navigate once, once those acceptance, uh, acceptance is come, come in. And sometimes it takes more than one year and, and um, we'll cover that in the next workshop and you, you shouldn't be discouraged. And I know many, many people their first year, you know, it's a good practice run and they learn a lot and then they do it again the second year and, and oftentimes have more success. Um, okay, so let's just jump right into it. So timeline, here we are um, in mid-September. So it's really um, a kind of critical time if you look at this timeline and that it's not too late for anything, any of the key pieces, but there's a lot of things that you should probably be think, thinking about if you're thinking about applying this year. But like I say, that you know this timeline would apply for next year or in five years from now. I think that generally these are pretty stable. Um, so hopefully you guys are working on identifying potential advisors and we talked a bit last time about how to do that. And um, if the program or programs that you're applying for require the GRE, which is some, but not all, and many are dropping them. And I think from my humble perspective, appropriately so, um, but some still do. And so you wanna be signing up and taking that um, if you need to, and Tracy will talk about that. I think you guys know um, that your scores last for five, for five years. And then Tracy will also talk about, as I mentioned, asking for letters of recommendation and how to go about that. Um, and we talked last time about, you know, that, that first email, that kind of cold email, if you don't know the potential advisor, and sometimes you do, and sometimes you know them quite well, sometimes you work with them. But how do you first reach out? And remember last time we had Maya Munsterman join us, and she shared one of her emails um, that she had sent with her attached CV. And the, in the last workshop, we talked about developing a CV and, and you know, kind of how to present yourself in, in your curriculum VTA and, and attaching that as a PDF to that initial email. Now, um, you know, let's say that they, they respond and it sounds like, you know, like there might be some, you know, some potential there and you want to set up a time to chat and maybe you're doing this already. Um, but um, I'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, just, just some thoughts uh, about maybe how to go about and prepare for that and then um, kind of how to, um, uh, conduct yourself in those informal interviews. And then usually most all applications are due at least in terms of priority deadlines in December. Oftentimes it's December 1st or December 15th. Sometimes it's December 30th. It just depends. But um, and then a lot of programs, but not all programs have what's called rolling admissions. So if you want to be um, uh, in there in the first group and have the kind of maximum potential, you know, for funding opportunities and stuff, you want to meet those priority deadlines. But that doesn't mean that you can't apply later on. And, and like I say, some have rolling deadlines and some of those rolling deadlines go clear into the spring. Um, but that really depends program by program. And then um, in non-COVID times, usually if things look like they're moving forward, um, you would oftentimes go if you can. It's not, of course, you know, financially feasible, especially for us in Hawaii, um, uh, to an in-person interview. But I think more and more now, not just being in Hawaii and the financial considerations, um, the you know, this kind of second stage interviews, if if they're held, would be on Zoom again. And then usually acceptance letters are sent out sometime between January and March. And then in April, you're usually kind of put on the spot to decide um, and uh, you have to let um, programs know and, and potential advisors know if you're coming or not, because sometimes there's, you know, there, there's, you know, one or a couple of spots in a lab. Um, and if you're not going to take it, they're going to offer it um, to maybe who's next in line. Okay, so what does applying uh, entail? Um, Tracy or Becky, do you want to take this slide? Uh, um, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, I was going to say because I know Becky's still doing some stuff. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, um, what does it? What does applying entail? Well, we're going to cover a couple of these things today. Um, some of them we covered last time. One is a personal statement. Um, Becky's going to cover over what goes in those a little bit later. Um, some schools are um, also requiring diversity statements, um, your experience in diverse communities, doing diverse research, how you would contribute to the diversity of the institution, um, curriculum vitae's, um, we covered that last time as well. Uh, three letters of recommendation, we'll touch upon those today. Uh, GRE scores, sometimes again, 
Um, they used to always be required and sometimes now schools are no longer requiring them. Um, plus your transcripts and then um, professors whose labs you're interested in joining. That, that's really the first, very, very first step is identifying those. So, Tracy, so, uh, go ahead. Oh. So, one of the things we talked about last time was the last um, item in the list, which is reaching out to those professors. Um, and so, that would be stuff you've already kind of been working on, identifying who you would like to work with, what schools they're at, um, and whether they're accepting students. So, it's, it's a little bit different than undergrad. Um, where oftentimes you're applying to go to a specific school that might have a specific program. Here, you're actually applying to work with certain professors and you're going to the school wherever they're at. Um, so it's a little bit different kind of target on how you are applying. Um, and you have to make connections with them because oftentimes you won't get accepted into the program without a faculty sponsor. Um, and probably especially for a PhD. So you have to have reached out to that person, had those conversations with them. They um, want to take you um, because then they're gonna sign off on your application. Um, and that's what happens in TCBS. Um, while we're not a PhD granting institution, when you apply to go to TCBS on the thesis track, you can only get into the track if, they're, if you have a faculty sponsor and then that sponsor becomes your advisor. Now, oftentimes on the application, you might have to um, say which faculty members you're interested in working with. Oftentimes that might also be in your personal statement. Um, but the more faculty members whose box you check off, um, the less serious they'll think you are about each one. So you, it's probably better to have fewer than more um, and only check the ones that you really wanna work with. Um, and the ones that you have reached out and who have showed an interest in you as well. Um, and the other thing too, is that especially when you're going to research one institutions, which are the PhD granting ones, um, professors might have affiliations in different departments. So you need to know what all those departments are and which one you're applying into. I'll just add to that real quick, if I could, Tracy, that um, I um, definitely agree with the advice that kind of less is more within a particular university in terms of how many people you're listing as potential advisors. But one thing to not be uh, shy to do is think about the potential of being co-advised. And, and sometimes that's among people um, that are in the same department or the same program. And sometimes it's, it's in, among people who are in themselves multiple programs. And that's um, kind of the flip side of this kind of second half of the advice here is that oftentimes, especially like Tracy saying at a research one university, a faculty member may be in themselves one person in multiple programs and they may have advice about maybe it's better to apply through this program than this program for X, Y, or Z reasons, oftentimes funding or practical reasons. But if you're, if you're thinking about being co-advised by, usually it's two people that would be your, your kind of co-major professors, that's something that can be you know, explored and can be attractive and don't be shy to do that if those people seem like they're interested in that possibility. So I just wanted to, to mention that as well. I don't know if Tracy or Becky wanna follow up on that. I mean, those are yeah, definitely. I mean, those are potential conversations you can have um, with them uh, before applying. Those are things you can also add to your personal statement. So your personal statement might be tailored for the different schools. So like you'll have like, you know, your standard boilerplate that you, you worked on, but you're also gonna tailor it to the specific school, the specific person. You might even know which, what project you'll be coming in to work on. So you will tweak those for your different applications and you could address who you're gonna work with. Um, you know, maybe if you're gonna have two potentially co-advisors, all those things can go into the, into the statement. Yeah. How do we go to the next slide? Really quick um, on the co-advisor thing, I guess that's a possibility that I never really 
had even considered before. Um, is that just like you think that your research would be more aligned? Like you you have your research goals, right? And you think that having an advisor that uh, you know Matt, like your example the other day talking about somebody maybe in the uh, paleontology department and then somebody in the biology department because you're working on extinction would be beneficial. Like, is that the reason for having two advisors or, or like what would be the purpose most of the time? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's typically the reason, right? Is that you identify um, a couple of people that have um, kind of sets of expertise that together are really perfect for the things that you're most interested in. And you can see very clearly how you would really like to have you know, both of their real focused attention um, and that your research kind of sits somewhere, if not squarely, but between them. There may be other more practical reasons and maybe Becky or Tracy want to add to this sure. just in terms of like fi that. finances and stuff. Yeah, Becky, you want to? Well, um, so in a PhD, you will have usually a committee of five people so you will be putting together a, a group of people. Sometimes it's four, but four to five people, depending on the university, you will be putting this group of people together anyway. So it could be that you just have one advisor, but a second person is, you know, plays a pivotal role on your committee. But another reason that you could have a co-advisor is maybe you're working with someone at an agency mm -hmm. and they cannot be officially, they, they cannot be, because they work at a, an agency and they're aligned with the university, but they're they're not officially like a university faculty. You might have a co-advisor where you're working with uh, a forest service person and a university person, for example, as a team. And in like in that situation that Becky just described, um, you're all, you'll have an on-campus advisor, which is the signatory on all the different forms that you have to fill out as you go along. But your, your true advisor, who's really helping you, really guiding you on that research journey with the project, that could be the agency person. It's just they can't be the primary one because they're not a university faculty member. Yeah. Um, and depending how they work together, they could be equal in their contributions. It just sort of depends on how all those relationships happen. Yeah, I don't, um, I guess my, my follow up then on that is so for example, let's say you're working with somebody in an agency, right, um, and they're sort of your primary advisor, they're the one that you're, you know, going to for insight on research, uh, and, and kind of your main mentor. Um, like how, how does funding work like that, because you're essentially you're like, hey, this is this is my main person who's guiding me, but this person probably can't fund you either, right? Sometimes they have more opportunities needs to fund you out honest actually yeah it, it really depends yeah and I was going to say we're going we're to cover the different kinds of funding opportunities a, a little bit later um, in the presentation so we'll go over how those things could work John cool that's great thanks guys um, yeah. but uh, I was going to say just on that part too is another way you could have co-advisors is let's say you have um, you know we, we collaborate on grants and it's very unusual for someone just to write a grant solo. So you have several people and it might be the two co-PIs um, on the grant that's gonna fund the graduate student to do the research and instances um, that could be co-advisor. So I would say in many cases for a lot of the TCBS students I've had in the recent past, um, I've been a co-advisor and the students go to each of us for different different aspects of the project. Yeah, and at, at big universities, it's not uncommon for a particular research lab to be shared by two PIs. So like, for example, at UH Manoa, at, out at Coconut Island at, at HIMB, um, Brian Bowen and Rob Tunin share a lab they call the Tobo Lab for the Tunin Bowen lab, right? But I think a lot of the students that are in that lab are either co-advised or their primary advisor is one or the other, uh, you know, Rob or Brian, but then the other is usually on their committee. But so I guess the, the point here in all of this is there's lots of different reasons and, and situations that you might end up being co-advised. And, and, but anyhow, the point is just that don't, don't be shy to explore that possibility. So one of the other things when you're getting your applications together is the GREs. Um, and I think almost everyone who's in TCBS now, except for the most current cohort, 
um, took the GREs um, because it was only starting um, and it just happened to coincide with COVID when we no longer required them. Um, and most schools, if they do require them, it's the general exam. It has three different components, uh, analytical writing, verbal reasoning, and quantitative reasoning. Um, there are also subject tests, and it looks like there's less subject tests now than when I applied because there used to be a biology one. Yeah. Um, so the schools might also require that as well. You have, so you really have to do your homework and look at what the program wants for applicants to have under their belt. Now, if you've already taken the GRE, which most of you probably have, your scores are good for five years. So if you're applying to a PhD program within five years of having taken that exam, your scores are still good. Now, the cost is, well, what it said this morning was $205 in the United States. If you take them in China, it looked like it was a little bit more. Um, but again, do your homework. Um, look at your specific um, program. It's not necessarily governed by the university per se, but it will probably be specific to each of the programs. So see what they require, if they still require the GREs, um, and if they require a subject test. Now, the, the scores are very different from when I took the GREs. They were much more like the SAT scores back then. Um, but this came from uh, ETS. It tells you kind of how to interpret those values. And oftentimes on the program websites, they might tell you like a minimum GRE score you need to even be considered. Um, so this, these tables here are just showing you um, the means and standard deviations for the three different sections. And then the lower table is showing you um, uh, the, the mean scores going into different programs. So I just put a, a square around the ones that we, our graduates in TCBS might fall into. So life sciences, uh, physical sciences, and social and behavioral sciences. Um, so that gives you an idea. So you wanna look, I mean, they, they're probably gonna tell you specifically like this is the G GRE scores we require, this is the minimum GPA. And if you don't have those, um, then you might, your application might not even be considered in the pool. I'll just add to that and say that there's been some good quantitative studies published recently that show that the GRE scores are not at all a good predictor of success in graduate school. So if you didn't do as well as you wanted on the GRE or you don't, if you take it, um, it, it, it's not something you know that it, it, in any way, shape, or form is a reflection on your ability to excel as a researcher in graduate school. It's it's a test that I think um, we're going to see more and more universities dropping, and it's I think it's rapidly happening because of this this you know research that's showing that it's really just not a good predictor. I think some schools are holding on to it because some fellowship programs have required it, and high GRE scores means you're more likely to get a fellowship, which means you're more likely to come with your own funding. But I think that quickly people are realizing that's not a good rationale to keep it. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if you see it drop from more and more, but definitely some still still require it. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. And, and I would just say from my own experience um, with students and even myself, you know, the most important things when I look at the applications, in fact, when I had students that were applying to TCBS to work with me, I never looked at the GRE scores because I wanted to see how well did they do in their classes and what, and what did people say about them in their recommendation letters. Um, to me, those were much more valuable indicators of how well a student would do. Plus I didn't know how to interpret the new value, so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I guess this is this is uh, back to me. Um, so financial considerations, and um, I first want to start uh, talking about just financial considerations for applying. Um, and to me, you know, it's it's outrageous that you need to you know pay for an application to apply to graduate school, but it is still the case at many universities. Having said that, many universities have fee waivers, and you just have to apply for those fee waivers. Sometimes they're gonna want some evidence that you qualify for the fee waivers, but don't be shy to poke around or to you know, email grad division or whoever's in, in charge of that particular program to say, hey, are there fee waivers? Because oftentimes each app, 
application, then like we were saying in the last workshop, you may want to apply to a half a dozen or even sometimes up to a dozen, um, you know, it, it, on the high end, I would think. Um, and it's about 50 to $100 usually per application. So that adds up really quickly. Um, and I, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it's hopefully one of the things that programs will start to go away from uh, in the future, but that that's not the case for all of them now for sure. And so you have to kind of think about, do I qualify for these fee waivers if they have them? And then if not, how many schools can I afford to apply to? Um, and then as Tracy just said, the, the GRE costs, um, it's just $205 in the United States. And then you get these five free scores if you send them on test day. So it's really, it, you know, it, it, it's to your advantage to know if there's, you know, five schools that you want your scores to get to send them that day so you don't pay the the fee and i don't know what it is is it do, do either does anybody know what it is to send it later after the fact um i don't yeah i, I didn't come across that when i was looking at their site for me for me when when i was doing it it was like 30 dollars per school after the fact so you want to make sure if you can to get those five free ones that come with the $205 fee. Um, I, and right. then, I think it was like 40 bucks when I did it. It's 40. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's gone up. So, you know, these costs add up quickly and this is part of the problem, the kind of structural problem in, you know, in graduate school in general, and certainly in you know, relation to our field that can, um, you know, really, um, uh, you know, change the pipeline of who can afford to apply to graduate schools. But like I say, there's a lot of um, uh, fee waivers um, and for application fees, and hopefully you don't have to take the GRE either because you've taken it within five years or the programs that you're applying to don't require it, but you may still have to take it. And if you do, make sure that you know, you know, if you can, make sure you know your schools in advance and avo avoid those $40 fees after. Um, I was just going to say ETS yeah. has a good business model. Not only do you have to pay to take the test, but then you have to pay to send your score. So and it probably doesn't take that much for them to make the tests. Yeah, it's yeah. Don't get me started on ETS. <laughs> you can tell you can tell how I feel about ETS. I've given them far too much money, and I don't want you guys to either. Um, but so then the last part again. This is kind of you know usually the situation when it's not COVID and you can you know afford and and you're not you know the most isolated archipelago in the world, and it requires a flight and you know hotel and car and everything else to go to do an in-person interview. So now I think you know one good thing is. Is that with you know quote unquote good thing so silver, silver lining of the pandemic is that most of these in person interviews um, are not in person now they're just this way on Zoom and so then the cost goes away um, so but if there are, but if you get serious and you can you know and you really want to meet that person you want to walk around campus you want to talk to grad students you know with what, whatever is you know available in terms of their kind of COVID protocols. Um, you want to you know think about that can can i get there do i want to go you know feel this you know city or this town out for a place to live for five or so years right um and if that's you know something that's feasible and doable it, it certainly if you haven't ever been there or haven't ever met that potential advisor in person it can be really helpful um, but it's certainly not necessary and of course it's harder now um, anybody want to add to that, Tracy, Becky, or does anybody have questions about any of this? Um, yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, I, I drove to the three where I met with different faculty members. Um, so it's very different in Hawaii. So I think the Zoom works well now, kind of equals, it allows everyone to have equal access to it. But if you do go visit, you probably just contact some of the grad students and ask if you can couch surf and most likely they'll say yes. And, and that's great experience for you to see what they're like and meet more people too, so. Yeah, you probably get, you know, all kinds of great insight out of yeah, the, the current graduate that. students, you know, that, that like, just like if you were to think about it for the program you're in now, if you were, you know, to talk. To somebody Someone contacted you, you'd you let them yeah. stay at your house probably, so yeah. Yeah, and you could give them some great insight. But remember, sample size, right? If you go and you stay with one or two people and they may be having a particularly hard time with their research or their advisor, that's not necessarily reflective of the whole program or even of that advisor, but it's definitely you know, something to, you know, to take into consideration. 
Um, okay, so whoops, one um, other slide here on financial considerations, and this one's kind of full of text. So I apologize about that, but but so in terms of thinking about the finances, right, is part of it is how much money do you need simply to attend school in that particular location? And I think Becky was talking about it, you know, last workshop that some places are wonderful and they're much more affordable. And so like she was saying that for her postdoc at Berkeley, she got paid quite a bit more than she did on uh, uh, at her PhD institution in uh, Florida and Gainesville, right, Becky? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Gainesville, but that she actually felt you know, more stress. Oh, poor, right? yeah. Right, because Berkeley is so much more expensive than Gainesville, right? And so cost of living in relation to to, to pay. Um, and so you want to think about those things and, you know, think about, can I, can I you know, kind of swing it? And part of that is going to unfold as you're, you know, applying and you're applying, you know, potentially, and we'll get to that here at the bottom of the slide, to things like fellowships, et cetera, and knowing what it is that you may be landing yourself or what's being offered by the, the PI in charge of the lab or being offered by the program that you're applying to, and then thinking about, okay, can I make it work in this particular place, right? And obviously, you know, some places are very expensive and some places are less expensive. Um, and some schools have, you know, lots of money to support you and other schools don't. And it's not necessarily, you know, a reflection of the, the you know, the quality of the experience that you're going to have and, and the research that you're going to do, that you could go to, you know, a, a place that's very affordable and maybe doesn't have a whole lot of support internally, but still have a really wonderful experience, right? Um, and so one of the things um, that can be good is to make a budget so that when you get these offers, whether they're internal from the program or the advisor or they're external, you're getting them. And I'll get to that in a second. You know how these things match up, right? Is this enough money to live in this particular place and afford this particular uh, school? And that, that's all kind of outside of paying for graduate school and the research. And I would say that in general, you probably at the PhD level don't want to start a PhD unless there it comes with a tuition waiver. Um, if you're paying out of pocket for tuition um, in your PhD, that funding is, is it, it, you know, it's not a great situation. And I think, you know, really, if you can, you're looking for a situation where it at least comes with a tuition waiver. And usually graduate assistantships is a kind of general term um, for a TA ship, a teaching assistantship, where you're actually teaching or helping teach courses or a research assistantship or a RA ship, they're sometimes called, and together a GA ship, um, they usually um, uh, come with a full tuition waiver, whether you're in state or out of state. One thing to be very careful about, and I probably put, should have put it in text here on this slide, is whether or not you're being offered salary with benefits or you're being offered a stipend with or without benefits. And you wanna you know, think about that, right? If you're gonna have to cover your own health insurance, your own dental insurance, if you have dependents, if you have a family, how are they gonna be covered? Those things are critically important to consider. And it depends a lot. And usually salary positions like a TA ship or th those kinds of um, GA ships have tuition waivers and some uh, uh, you know, health insurance, dental insurance, vision insurance. Um, and sometimes it's quite good. And then sometimes when you're getting funding that's a research assistantship through your advisor's grant and what we oftentimes would call an RA ship, it's oftentimes a stipend that comes with some money, but maybe not all the money that you need to pay for your tuition. And sometimes they've written in to cover your health insurance, et cetera, and sometimes they have it. And those are really important considerations. Um, Becky, Tracy, you want to add to that? Um, um, I, oh, go ahead, Becky. No, I think that's good. We're going to do the next one. We're going to talk more specifically about funding, right? So I think that's yeah, good. Yeah, in, in the next workshop. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Okay. And then so scholarships and fellowships. Um, one thing 
potential advisors love is that if you're applying for your own money, whether you get it or not, that shows that you're, you know, you're willing to, you know, kind of put in the, you know, the, the effort and go the extra mile to apply for fellowships. If you get a fellowship that funds you, you know, partially or fully, um, you kind of really are writing your own ticket, right? It makes it so much easier to get into a program of your choice if you're coming and saying, look, I have this fellowship that is going to cover my cost of living plus my tuition and maybe also some money for your research. That makes it really easy for a potential advisor to say, yeah, that sounds great. Come on, right? Because they may not have that funding in place uh, for you. But if you're coming you know, with it, you've obviously convinced that you know, that, that scholarship um, committee or that fellowship committee that the science is exciting and that you're the right person to do it and that you're going to do it in a rigorous way. Um, and, and then it's kind of your golden ticket to get in uh, to programs of your choice. Having said that, you don't need to. There's lots of other ways to find funding. And so in addition to kind of external support um, and some you know, common ones that I think you're probably familiar with are the National Science Foundation has graduate research fellowship um um what does this p stand for program program that'd be yeah. my guess yeah yeah fellowship program um the ford foundation um has uh, diversity fellows uh noaa has the the nancy uh foster scholarships if you're doing work in a national marine sanctuary et cetera et cetera and you you can kind of poke around you know google searching and, and whatnot um there's quite a bit of support that you can apply to to go to graduate school um, and, um, and then in addition, there's the internal support, the support that either is coming from the university through the program that you're applying to, or from the program itself, or from directly from the potential advisor. And, um, and so there's lots of ways to fund yourself, um, both internal and external. Um, Tracy, Becky, you wanna to add to that? That's good. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of fellowships, can you guys touch on the timeline? Like if you're coming, uh, if you're applying with a fellowship that's already been granted to you, is that the kind of the normal thing? Like if I was to apply to a fellowship this year, that would put yeah. me applying next year to start fall of 23, right? I think no. If you applied for a fellowship now, um, you'd, you'd apply for the fellowships at the same time you're applying for the schools. Yeah. Okay, so you want to have an answer, like if you got it or not yet probably, when you're applying. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. You, you probably hear like around the same time as you heard from the school. What, what so happens in that case if you don't get the fellowship or the grant, but you get accepted into the, <laughs> or is it like conditional? They're like, you get into the program if you get the grant or you don't, if you don't. <laughs> it, well, sometimes it might be different. So like uh, an advisor might say, um, I, uh, I'm interested in accepting you, but only if you find your own funding. Um, so they won't sign off until that's known or the program says we're going to accept you you might not get the scholarship or fellowship and now it's up to you to decide whether you're going to come in which case you'd probably like end up paying your own tuition for maybe the first year or semester or something like that and then you're i assume trying to get funding the following year or something i i, I would assume so but you know with funding it's like it's hit or miss and um, some of the ones like listed here, like the NSF one is very competitive, it's national. Um, so it's like a needle in a haystack and you have to really know how to like write those types of proposals. Um, and those ones are due usually early in the fall. And I'm trying to remember, I think- NSF I think ones are usually due in October. They're due in October. And I think you can only apply twice and you have to be at the very beginning of graduate work. So I don't know what that means. Like if you're a master's, you finished it, and then you apply to the PhD, it might, I don't know if it's like the first two years of PhD or if having the master's means you're not eligible. No, you're still eligible. You're still eligible, yeah. Um, but there are other ones like NOAA has lots of different kinds of ones. I was funded on one that was through a National Estuarine Research Reserve. So in different parts of the United States, they have these reserves. 
and each reserve has like two fellowships. Um, so those become a little less competitive because it's in a specific mm -hmm. geographic region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I'm just looking at Ford Foundation right now, like their applications are due January 6th. Mm -hmm. So it's about the same time as you would sending into the schools. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just second what Tracy was saying that you'll hear from a lot of advisors that they'll, you know, they'll, they'll take you if you get your own funding. Um, another way to, you know, think about funding yourself is to look for advisors that already have a grant. They've gotten a grant where they've written in support for a PhD student and they advertise. And um, I probably should have put it on the slide. I'll send it out as an email after. Um, but if, um, if you want to kind of get announcements about people who have funding and they're looking for somebody to carry out a PhD on a particular research topic where the funding's already ready in place and then you're essentially applying to be that person um, there's you know there's there's for example ecolog which is a kind of directory for ecology that a lot of those come out evolved there are a lot of um, evolutions uh, uh, phd opportunities come out as well as the, they both have archives on the website that you can look at um, etc et um, and so you can you can do it by you know looking for people that have money already or you can do it by looking for your own funding, either external or internal, um, and then you know, kind of bring in your own funding. Or you can kind of work to hedge your bets, right? And sometimes too, like if you're applying to an advisor that's not in a situation where they have a grant and they have the money for your PhD, and you're applying, say, for a Ford Foundation Fellowship or a National Science Foundation Fellowship, the same time you're also applying for a TA ship or some other GA ship in the department. So that then if say that the Ford Fellowship or the and or the National Science Foundation Fellowship doesn't come through, you have this other you know, iron in the fire that maybe the department's gonna say, okay, we've got a TA ship for you for the next three years or the next five years and it's X amount of money and it's a tuition waiver and it has or it doesn't have health insurance, et cetera. So you wanna kind of head, head your bets if you're applying without the advisor already having the money. One little kind of important thing to add to that is if the advisor already has the money and they've gotten the grant, the direction of your PhD might have some flexibility but it's kind of determined already, right? There's this project that has been funded that you're going to carry out, and you may, you know, really be the you know creative driver of that. But you're going in this direction. Whereas if you want to really create your own thing from the beginning, from the ground up, you want to get your own funding for your research. Does does that make sense? And for what it's worth, the European PhDs that tend to be faster, they tend to only be about three to four years. They tend to be in the model that the advisor has the money, has the project, and you come in and you have that paid position and you carry out that research under their research umbrella of the things that they're trying to get done and they have the grant for you to, to work on. In the United States and um, some other countries, it's much more of a mix. It can go either way. I was just going to comment. So just on um, starting with that one is um, even, I mean, if you get accepted to work on a specific project, that's great. You have the money. You don't have to ha have that worry of finding the money. But just because a proposal was written and funded, it doesn't mean that you don't still have a lot of uh, ability to create your own stuff. Because just because you wrote it down, it's not the same as executing it. And so right. much changes over from like writing the proposal to actually doing the project and then writing it up. So- But it does depend on how flexible your advisor is willing to be. Well, I'm not even thinking that. It's, it's not necessarily taking in new directions, but the whole process <laughs> of executing mm -hmm. what was written is a whole other level of experience and creativity beyond just the initial writing the ideas down. Um, and the other thing I was gonna um, say too is that other places where you can find these types of opportunities listed are often on um, different uh, uh, society web pages. Uh, they have, I don't know if they've separated these out now, but they have job boards. And oftentimes in the job boards, they'll have not just jobs, but also 
um, graduate student opportunities to work in specific uh, lab groups on specific projects. So there's lots of different places to find that kind of information. And just to kind of conclude things here on financial considerations, and then um, we'll move on here to the next topic. Um, the grants, as I was saying, can go to your advisor and then in turn to you. And sometimes, like Tracy Becker was saying, it could be that a couple of people got the grant as co-PIs and maybe they would be your co-advisors, et cetera. The other is to, aside from fellowships and scholarships, you can apply for your own grants. And, and on that note of what Tracy was saying, the societies ha have funding and they oftentimes have good funding. You know, it's usually a couple thousand dollars at a time, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000 to help you. And if you're, you know, doing work, say on, you know, lizards, you might apply to the Herpetological Society to get money to go and do your research. Or even if you have a grant, you know, from your advisor, you want extra money to do something, you know, you know, cool that they didn't even think about, but you're thinking about. Um, I had an amazing postdoc visit us in my evolution classes yesterday, um, who she fully funded her PhD through different grants. And she listed, must have been eight or so different granting agencies. It was National Geographic. It was, you know, this is why I was thinking Herpetological Society. It was a whole bunch of these different ones, the Society for the Study of Evolution. She did three long field seasons in um, the Greek islands in the Aegean Sea. And she brought research assistants every year for three months. And they boated to 44 different islands. And it was incredibly expensive, incredibly impressive, you know, in, in terms of, you know, just thinking about it, making me tired, how much work she did. But she funded it entirely herself. She has an amazing relationship still with her PhD advisor and had support back at her, you know, PhD university through a TA ship for her you know, um, covering her tuition, her, you know, salary and her, um, uh, in, you know, health insurance, but the research itself had no funding. So she had to get the grants to do the research and she wanted to do this really, you know, expensive research halfway around the world, but she made it work, right? And so you, you can think about, you know, once you're in it as well, applying for grants as well as applying for them before you get in. And there's pros and cons, right? If you're, the advisor already has money for you, that's great. But if if you learn how, like she did, to convince people to give you money and you do that for five years, you're gonna be really good at doing it beyond, right? So, you know, that there's something to be said for kind of, um, you know, funding your own way too. Um, mm -hmm. And then- and now yeah, I, I, yeah, I was just gonna to add that um, it's really important to get grant writing experience so even if you are funded through a graduate school, you really should take opportunities to apply for it because once you graduate, you're gonna be expected to know how to do that and to be successful at obtaining grants. So you do need to get that experience. Um, students who don't do that in graduate school and by the time they graduate, they're, they're in a more difficult situation because they've never had to do it. Um, so take those opportunities um, to, to try to write the grants beyond just doing your proposal, like go for them, take what you wrote for your proposal and submit it somewhere, see if you can get it funded because you're gonna have to be able to do that, especially with a PhD, to be able to do that almost as soon as you graduate. Yeah, 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 that's really good advice. And, and then just lastly here, you know, some of us just end up taking out loans. I certainly did. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you have to be careful about how much you're willing to take out versus what your earning potential is going to be after. Um, but it's not uncommon that, you know, sometimes you need some extra support and there are, you know, loans and then there's, you know, the, the kind of, uh, as you guys know, those that are, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the federal loans that have, you know, the kind of fixed interest rate ones, I can't remember the names of them are now, um, but, um, and, and then there's ones that maybe you, you want to stay away from that have these variable interest rates, um, but there are loans, and then people sometimes do just get a job, whether it's related to their research, but it's not actually part of their research at all, but just a job, for example, with an agency, et cetera, outside of the university, just to help pay the bills. Or sometimes you just get a job that's a job just to make sure that you make ends meet. And um, that usually means that your PhD is gonna take longer, but that's okay too, right? And I've had many friends that their PhD, you know, take eight or 10 years because, 
they're you know working these other jobs at night, et cetera. Um, and that's just the you know the kind of individual choices you know of going to a place maybe without great funding that's very expensive, et cetera. And you have to think about those considerations. Okay, let's move on um, to this video call with potential advisors. Um, and um, I think this is my last section. Um, mm -hmm. So so one thing that you you know want to think about, and I think we talked about this in the last workshop, is that this is a two way interview, right? Like you, th they're trying to get a sense of you, but you also need to take this as an opportunity to get a sense of them, right? But you're not, you don't want to, you know, put them, you know, to the fire, so to speak, and and you know make them feel like you're, you know, you're drilling them. And if they're doing that to you, then maybe that's a red flag too, right? That this is really a conversation. And it's not so much an interview like you may have for some jobs where it's a kind of formal you know structure usually. Um, it's more, you know, time to chat and see if you're really of like minds and you really get excited about the same things and, you know, um, and, and, you know, personally, does it feel like it's going to fit, but it's also your time to ask your questions about, you know, how they advise, what their advising style is. Um, it, it's your time to ask questions about potential projects, whether it's something that's funded or, or not. It's, it's your time to get a sense of, um, you know, how um, things operate in the lab, what, you know, they might have as advice in terms of, you know, where to live and, and you know, cost of living and quality of life. And if it's possible, you know, to talk to them about would it be okay to get in touch with some of your current or you know, former students and get a sense of, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, you want to essentially think of it really as a two-way street. Like you want to find out by the end of that Zoom call, does this feel like a good fit? And am I getting good answers that make me feel like, yeah, I want to go work with this person and that many of the things that I'm concerned about are starting to kind of fall into place. Um, Becky, Tracy, you want to add to that? I think... What my what I'm going to add will uh, what I would add is covered in my next section on the personal statement. Okay. Yeah. And I would say one of the really important things is listening to your gut. So after that experience of having this conversation, if you have a good feeling, listen to it. If you have reservations, mm -hmm. listen to it because usually what I found is that when I have reservations or if there's some flags that go up. They've always turned out to be true in the end. And it's taken, you know, many years of being a professional to really listen to my gut. But it's always, your gut is always spot on. So trust yourself. Yeah. Wow. That's great advice, Tracy. I, yeah. I, I feel the same way. Um, and so, yeah. So let's um, kind of maybe move forward here. I think you guys know this last part here that obviously you want to read carefully through the PI's website. At most, you know, major research universities that have PhD programs, most potential advisors will have a website, but not all. If they don't have a website, that's fine. And you can obviously find their, you know, papers. And sometimes, you know, you might want to um, read some of their more recent papers, but sometimes you want to go back to some of their, you know, earlier work that maybe was, you know, really important foundational stuff for what you're thinking about, right? So it doesn't have to be the, you know, the most recent stuff. Um, but you do, I think, want to at least be in tune with what it is that they normally think about and and you know kind of you know what are they publishing where are they publishing how are they presenting their science if you don't do that homework then you're probably not going to be really well prepared to have a good high level conversation with them about research in their group and about how your interests fit right you don't have to read everything that they've ever written right and and i wouldn't do that but um but you do want to read some of it and then you know especially be able to come and say, hey, I read, you know, such and such that you, you wrote and it got me really excited about thinking about this. What do you think about, you know, da, 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 da. And I think that goes a long ways. Um, and then, of course, it's nice to practice talking about your background, kind of what brings you to this place, to this you know, informal interview and the, I, you know, and the thought of going into a PhD program with that person and your research interests. And it's nice if you can to just practice this, you know, grab another, you know, um, uh, you know, a friend or another graduate student 
um, or an advisor in practice talking about your research. I, I conducted, you know, this thesis project or this internship project. And, you know, these were the things that, you know, came out of it or are coming out of it, et cetera. Um, and learn how to, you know, it's a little bit of, I think, learning a kind of salesmanship thing, right? Where you want to be able to present your, you know, professional research life in a way that's engaging to other people and gets a conversation going and gets, you know, those sparks uh, uh, flying in, in that other person's mind. Um, so having said that, let's move on. Um, oh, this is just, yeah, some kind of more about that, that you want to be, you know, in terms of talking about your research, be able to say some specifics about it, not just to say, you know, I'm interested in, you know, entomology, I'm interested in marine ecology, but what beyond that, you know, beyond the general, are you most interested in, right? Um, and maybe what you've been working on, but also where you see it going. Um, and you want to include questions that you um, want to ask or are asking, right? So like, what are the things that really gets you excited, right? Why would you want to do a PhD? What are the, some of those questions that roll around and that you go, oh man, wouldn't it be cool if I could, you know, answer these questions or at least contribute to answering these questions? So come in with that. And it doesn't have to be a lot, maybe just a couple. Like, I'm really interested in seeing if I can't, you know, solve this particular problem or answer this particular question. That'll help a lot in terms of that potential advisor understanding the way you think. And that's a lot of what they're looking for. Um, and then, like I said, practice in your elevator pitch with peers and advisors. Okay, um, Tracy, um, do you want to take this or Becky? Yeah. I, I yeah. So, so some of it was um, hit on the previous slides, but the big thing is you have to do your background research. You got to really like study up on the person that's going to potentially become your advisors. So, what are they currently studying? That you're probably going to find on the website. Their most recent projects. Um, what are they known for? You know, what is their reputation in the field? Um, so go to their websites, review their publications, do Google searches, make sure you do your background on them. Um, and then you also have to think about how you're going to fit into their research groups. So knowing about them now, because you've done your background research, how are you going to fit into the group? Um, why are you interested in working with them? Um, what are you thinking about doing for your thesis? So you have to be able to have that part of the conversation ready. So, you know, if you're applying to work for someone who studies nitrogen cycling in estuaries, you're not going to come and talk about doing whale research. Um, so you have to imagine yourself in their group and the kinds of research that you would conduct that fits under their umbrella of interest. Um, and in this conversation, you should also ask them like, what are their expectations for their graduate students? Um, and the other really key important thing is you should ask if you can speak to their current or former students. This is like one of the most critical things. So it's not only this conversation you're having with them, but you need to do your background research and talk to the students. If they're hesitant, that's a red flag. So they should be like, yeah, here, here's their names, contact them. And when you, when you talk to the students, you need to get a sense of what that person's like as an advisor. Um, because this is, especially with a PhD, even more so than with the masters, this is a lifelong relationship. And you wanna make sure it's a good fit in both directions so that, you know, you want to like this person at least 90% or more of the time and that you guys can get along. Um, the other part is you need to think about what are your expectations from an advisor? What are you trying to get out of them? What do you want to get out of graduate school? Besides the degree, what are those experiences or skill sets? Um, what kind of person would be a good advisor for you? What would those qualities that work well with your personality be? You should also ask them about how most of their students are funded um, and if they currently have funding to support a student. Um, and again, that's more, that really varies from advisor to advisor. So for example, I feel very uncomfortable accepting students if I don't have funding. So that means when students come to work with me, they're working on a project that's already been set. 
Um, but other people are very comfortable with taking students, um, whether they have funding or not, and allowing the students to seek out their own funding. So everybody has different philosophies about that, but it's good to ask ahead of time. Um, and then after you're done, again, listen to your gut. You know, if you feel good afterwards, that's a good sign and go talk to their students. But if you have any hesitancy, again, this is a lifelong relationship. You are gonna work very closely with the person. Um, you might reconsider. Um, so you have to think about whether they're a good fit for you and they're gonna think about whether you're a good fit for them. And just lastly, again, it's a lifelong commitment. Um, they are committing to helping you get your degree and to promote you professionally. Um, and you are committing to work with them and to do your very best job possible. So again, it's a, really a two-way street. Um, and sometimes I've had former students who've done all of this, right? They met with the students and yet somehow it fell through the cracks that this person was maybe not the best advisor or maybe not the best advisor for them. And they either like left the program with the masters, changed advisors, um, but they didn't know until about a year into the program that something was really going south. But it's always best to try to do your full homework um, to really try to minimize those kinds of things happening. We, um, we've been given a lot of information and I wanna turn it over to Becky here to talk about a critically important uh, part, which is writing your statement of purpose. But before we do that, um, do you guys have questions for us yeah. at this point? Because I know we're throwing a lot at you fast. Yeah, I. so this is kind of a random one. Uh, <laughs> so, the I think the the questions that I'm like turning over like a PhD I, I don't know if I have it in me I'll be honest but, but I'm at least considering it theoretically um, but the questions that I would actually be interested in answering in that sort of format and that sort of time frame are not exactly the questions that I'm working on for my project right now um, so so I wonder about that transition of like hey this is this is what I want to aim at. Is it even feasible to jump from something where I'm like, hey, I'm doing this project, which I think is super cool, but the question that I actually want to ask for a PhD is totally different, and I don't really have experience in that. Like, do I need to spend a year or two after this program to fill in those gaps before I would be considered, or is it more just like, if you have funding, you're good to go? <laughs> you know? That's a great question, John, and, and Becky, you are not in your head. Yes, do you want to field that one? Sure. Um yeah, I think that can go either way. If you because if you have a master's and you can explain like, and then I'll, that's one of the things on the next slide is sort of explaining your pathway and your personal statement, how you got where you are today. So explain what your background and how that wove you to now you want to switch to this other field. If you've got the master's, you've got the experience in in doing research in using the literature in test, you know, looking at these big ideas and those, those critical thinking skills, most people can switch. Um, and, and, you know, depending on the advisor, some people might, um, might not like that, but if you've got good letters of recommendation from your, your current Matt from your master's and, they're like, yes, he can definitely do it. He's got the skills. Then it's it's not that big of a deal. And if you were ready, you could switch right to a PhD. If you think you're not ready, then yeah, it might be really good experience to try this new field for a year or so, get some experience there. And that will then help you get more specific for what you want to do with your PhD and kind of help you hone it in. So if you're not ready, I definitely recommend the latter, but it's certainly possible to, to switch yeah. fields. And to clarify, it's not really like a field switch. It's more just like, like it's still focused on coral, the thing, the idea uh -huh. that I'm kind of turning over. It's just, it's not really herbivore management. It's not really, it's, it's not what I'm doing for my project right now. It's like oh, unrelated that's... enough that I like, I'm like, I don't know if I could bridge the gap in, in like a Oh, I think treatment. definitely you could. You have the background in corals, you've got the, ecological background so I think definitely you don't I, have to yeah I wouldn't consider that like a, like that's a, not that big of a deviation yeah that's not a big that I wouldn't even consider that a jump it'd be more like you're studying corals now you want to go hug trees the, or you know, humans you know. yeah yeah okay cool 
Yeah, and I'll just add to that too, that, uh, you know, we all make, you know, shifts in our research lives as we move forward. And yeah. I don't think there's, I mean, maybe there's a few people, but in general, I don't think it's, in, you know, it's just straight line all the way for a career for very, you know, many people. Most of us, I certainly myself, jump around a bit within these, you know, questions that we're interested in. Having said that, I would think about it from your perspective of, how comfortable you feel and are you going to you know like be feel like you're you know you're you're ready and that will in turn you know lower your anxiety or whatnot when you enter a phd you know so but i i would agree with becky and tracy that changing the you know kind of new facet of thinking about how, you know research on, on on coral reefs that's just a kind of normal thing of a research, you know, career moving and looking at things from different angles that I would think most advisors would be really excited about. And yeah, there'll be a steep learning curve. So learning how to do some new kind of research, but research is research, you know, and if, if your field is marine ecology and it's coral reef biology, and you're just learning how to do a new kind of research within it, that's, a, I mean, that's, I, I don't know, to me, that sounds like a, a great idea. And I think most advisors or potential advisors would see that as well. Okay, so Becky's going to talk a bit about writing a personal statement. And this is a really important part of your whole application package. Yeah, it's a really important part of the application pass, package, but it's also an extension of the last couple slides um, that Tracy and Matt have mentioned. The purpose of the statement is for you to get across why you are the perfect fit for this kind of position that you're applying for, for this school. Show that you put in a lot of thought into what you wanna do your research on, why you wanna to go to this program, why you wanna work with this particular faculty member and how well you can express your ideas and getting this across. The real goals of a personal statement are to make it personal. It's, it's really to represent you and the, the personal statements that fall flat are the ones that are super generic. Like this is a great program and I've always wanted to study coral reefs my whole life. And, in, and there's just not much there that's specific about what you wanna do and why you're choosing this place and this group of people to work with. You definitely do want to make it personal. You want to present your accomplishments and sh um, share them, your academic accomplishments, and, and the other things that are part of that academic journey that maybe don't like show up necessarily in your like writing of your thesis. So some of the like grit and personal struggle that you had to go through to get where you are are good things to put in your in your personal statement, but you don't want to overshare. Don't share information that's not professional, that's not related to this topic. Um, next slide. Um, so I borrowed this from this website, but I think this encapsulates five questions to ask yourself before you write your personal statement. And the first one is really, about the path, this pathway, how you got here, why, why you want to complete this research, what led you to pursue this? So for John, for your example, you were working on herbivore management in coral reefs, and that in the course of doing your master's thesis, you realized there are these other gaps in knowledge and these unknowns or these areas, applications to management that you thought nobody was looking at. And that sort of led you down this pathway. And this is where you wanna really focus and make a further study. So we talked about this at the first workshop, a PhD does have to be philosophical. It has to be a kind of on a big meaty topic and it has to have lots of aspects, including conceptual components. So making that clear what you wanna do and why you wanna do it and how you got here um, is a really great way to personalize your statement. Then why are you applying to this university um, with these potential advisors? You definitely want to, a lot of it is about fit. So is this a center for uh, a certain technique that you really need to learn to be able to do your research? Or 
the field sites in the area are exactly where you want to be, the, what the um, faculty member is doing in his or her lab is the, is the exact kind of work that you want to do. You want to get those ideas across. I also want to talk about your strengths, talk about your projects so far. I mean, doing a master's beforehand, you've got a lot more to talk about than just coming in from your undergrad. So talk about your strengths, talk about any kind of skills that you've developed along the way, a traveling experience, those kinds of things can also be important. If you've got special techniques that you learned, I think I have that on the next slide, but those are all like important strengths and skills that can be transferable. And then finally, uh, in a PhD application, they're also gonna be wanting to know what are your career goals? So we talked about this a little bit last time, like things you can do with a PhD. Do you wanna be in academics? Do you wanna run a nonprofit? Do you want to um, do some kind of um, consulting? The, the kinds of things that you wanna do, get the outcome at the end, like. Why are you getting a PhD? What are you gonna do with it? That should be sort of in there too. Now you might not know everything, but just provide kind of a general example why you're, why you're bothering to do this PhD because PhD is a huge commitment. It's a commitment of your time and your advisor's time. It's a commitment of university resources. So everyone wants to really know that you have a good motivation for doing it. Okay, next slide. So personal statement, it shouldn't be super long, one or maybe two pages, but really not longer than that. There, some schools have word limits, some don't. You wanna keep, it's gonna be an essay format. We're gonna have an introduction, a body and a conclusion. And the formats may differ a little bit, but the purposes that I'll talk about on the next slide is the same. So you wanna be very specific in, again, it's personal. It's about you, it's about how you got where you are, why you wanna go in this new direction and what you wanna, what you wanna do and why you wanna do it here. So you probably want to change your personal statement for each place that you apply. Not the whole thing, but make sure that the part about fit for that specific place is personalized to that. So it doesn't seem so generic because people wanna say like, I want him or her to come here because this place is the best place for uh, the, be, to be able to do this kind of research. We have the resources here. This is going to be a great, you know, a great partnership. And so you don't want to have something super generic. You want to make it specific to each place that you apply. Um, okay. Anyone want to add? Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I guess I would just add to that that I agree that making it pers personal is good because yeah. you want you and you're, yeah. you're bringing, you know, as, as, an, as an individual to come through. But I would say that one mistake, at least from my um, perspective, that people oftentimes make with personal statements is that they kind of um, tend to write the whole thing as a kind of personal narrative mm -hmm. um, and not really about the research and the yes. questions and how they fit in the field. And what I don't think you want to do is spend you know half or more talking about the things that motivated you when you were a child to be in love mm -hmm. with this particular yeah topic. That's usually not an effective way um, to convince somebody that you understand the field and the open questions and what's exciting and why you want to do that particular stuff. I think that is, is more how you bring in your, your, your you know, own life into it, right? Is how do you right. come to be in this place in this, you know, in this research rather than the things that maybe first grabbed you emotionally. Um, I, I, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, that could be a small part of it, but that shouldn't be the major part of it. And, and you want to make sure um, that you don't have any of that fluffy, hokey language in it. Like, I've always loved the ocean ever since I saw my first Jacques Cousteau movie, because this is professional. And so the whole document has to be professional. You won't have any of that kind of language in there. It's not a journal entry. It's not like some, it's not the same thing that you'd write in your journal or write in a letter to a friend. It's, it's, it's more formal than that. Yeah, you're selling yourself to this program. Yeah, and, and that passion will come through, right? If you write yeah. about how you have been working in this field and this is the, you know, where you see it all going for you and stuff. Like if, if you do a good bit, a job of conveying that, 
they're going to understand that somewhere along the way that that you know emotional trigger stuff you know happened right i don't think it, it's kind of implied if you do a good job of writing the statement um becky did you want to talk about this yeah so it does have kind of a formal structure the first paragraph you know some kind of way to hook the reader in but again not super corny um but um begin with that hook and and you should have your thesis your main argument right up there which should be you know i am the best person i'm a really good person for this program this is an excellent fit here's what i can contribute to this program and what i can learn from this program and have that sort of up there right up front and then then the rest of it is is supporting your argument your relevant courses your research experience workshops you've done and special skills you have and i think if you go to the next slide i have better stuff on there um the things that will set you apart you know so you can have special experiences in your background and your personal history but like matt said is or tracy said it's not it's, it's not everything in your whole life. It, it, it's part of it, it's baked in, it's weaved in there, but it's not, but it's really about you and this research. And it's a place where not only can you describe, so you should be spending time like describing some of the stuff you've done in your masters and not only just, you know, you found A, B and C, but you might have things in there that show your resilience, your grit, how you've overcome obstacles, how you um, worked in a place where you didn't speak the language or you had these many difficulties and, and you, you were able to persevere through them and what you learned from that and how that leads to where you are now in the next steps that you wanna do. I mean, don't just throw in obstacles just to throw in obstacles. It has to have a purpose, but those things can help make your statement a little bit more compelling. Um, and because you you will have your masters, you, you've got now this experience from doing your masters, you've got a lot of more stuff to write about than somebody just coming from, from your undergrad. So you, I'm sure if you sit down and you give it enough time to brainstorm, you'll be able to come up with some things that you think help distinguish you and make you who you are. Um, how do you guys feel about that? Do you, all, if you think about it right now, can you think about a few things about yourself that that distinguish you, what, where you've been, what you've been through? I see some nodding, nodding heads. Nodding. Yes. Anyone want to share one? I have. I have to admit, <laughs> it's like on on paper, I'm yeah. I'm just like I'm not a phenomenal student. Like in my in my undergrad, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I, this is actually one part that I always struggle with. Is I'm just like my my life. I've I've absolutely had struggles. Uh, you know, but most of them are like personal. I'm not trying to like throw them in my personal statement, you know, and like, I've learned a lot in this graduate program. And I've, I've worked probably harder than I ever have in my life before. But I'm also just like, there, I just think that there are so many people that have been through so much more to get to this spot that I feel weird talk, like, trying to like, hype up how hard my path has been as like a white dude in the world. So I, I, don't, I don't know. It's not about that. It's, it's, it's not about you. It's not a competition. It's more about how, um, where, what your experiences show a little bit who you are, but it's it's not a it's not a competition of so and so's traipsed through, uh, you know, more mud than this other person and walked more miles or whatever. It's it's not that or or had to deal with more obstacles because of their personal background or their race or gender or any of those things. That's it's more a, about um why you why you want to go down to this next step and and you know what the things you can offer and that those offerings are a conglomeration of all your experiences and who you are so it might take a little bit of time thinking about it but 
I'm sure you all have, you all have that. I think without question, there's nobody who gets through life without yeah. going through hardship. But I also would just say that you don't have to include it in your personal student yeah. for graduate school. It's totally optional. And, you know, if it, if it makes sense to you to say, you know, like Chase is, I, sorry, Becky is saying that, you know, I, I, you know, went through, you know, such and such, and I still was able to accomplish this master's thesis or finish my undergrad despite or high school or whatever, those things that make sense, then, then great. And it's part of weaving the story to get you, you know, to this point. But if you don't, feel comfortable or it doesn't yeah. fit it's not at all necessary and you can just stick to the research and you can make it a compelling this is from my perspective you can make yeah. a very compelling personal statement about the research and less about your you know your hardships and the things that you it's really through. the passion it's that it's it so that your passion shows through yeah 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 don't write anything you're not comfortable writing or sharing about yeah um, you want, can you go back one, there was one thing I was going to hit on the last one. Um, do, um, yeah, do have, write in the active voice and, and you should maintain confidence in this. You shouldn't be like, well, I think I can do this PhD. You know, this, this should be, and it's hard to write in this way, but you've got to, you've got to sell yourself and that's painful and get somebody to help you. Um, read it, make sure that you're coming off the way you think you're coming off, make sure you get some help, help with that. And then the last next one. Um, there's some do's and don'ts and um, I have all of this in a handout I can put in the chat. Um, but you definitely want to make sure that you've got it well written, proofread, revised that your, really your passion is there, your, your main argument is there, why you're a good fit for this program. Um, it's not, as we mentioned, it's not like your autobiography. It's not everything you've done in your life. It's, it's specific to this opportunity. And, you know, it, not only are you gonna have this, but you're gonna have letters of recommendation so this personal statement and the letter of recommendation kind of go hand in hand in some ways that should be following each other. If you say something in here and it's really not matching with your letters of recommendation, then there's that, that, that is a little bit of a red flag. So, so you want to um, make sure that, you know, this is really who you are. And, and it, it just, I would definitely advise getting friends faculty members or family to read a draft for you and give you some comments. Yeah, I'll second that, that you want to revise this several times. This isn't something you want to write the night before, right? This is yeah. a, a process, an iterative process. And hopefully if, if you learn anything in graduate school, it's that you don't just turn something in and that's it, that it's, that's the beginning, right? As you, yeah. you, you, you create the draft and then you go over it and over it. And on that note, I would say that you want to have these Zoom conversations, these informal interviews with potential advisors before you probably draft this up, right? right? Because you're tailoring it, as Becky was saying, to each program, each university, and each advisor. It might be that there's some general stuff that's in each one, and there probably is because you are you, but it, it it's, it's something that if, if you are thinking about that conversation and what is that research synergy and those sparks and those, you know, maybe even nuts and bolts practical things that, you know, that you guys talked about, that's going in there, right? And ultimately, probably too, that's going in there is something about that you've had conversations with Dr. So-and-so about potentially joining their lab and, and that, 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 that is in, would you agree, Becky and Tracy, that that's mm -hmm. in there, that you, you've yeah. already established this relationship and that this is who you, who or whom you're applying to, right? Yeah, definitely. That should be very clear from your statement. Okay, so I think we just okay. have about five minutes left. Yeah. We're getting here in the last couple of slides. Um, I'll just quickly say that, you know, we want to keep in mind the deadlines. 
Um, and you know, this year or other years, usually the deadlines fall in the first half of December. Some schools are a little different, but most all of them are in the first half of December. Um, generally, the, the, um, the graduate school um, admissions committee will get together oftentimes in January-ish and review um, all the applicants at once. And they're, um, like Tracy and Becky were saying before, they're looking to see you know, do you have all the pieces? Do you do, did you get all the you know different documents in? Do you meet the minimum standards? Um, and then um, they're gonna reach out to those people that you've listed as potential advisors and say, hey, you know, Jess or John or Blake, etc., has has set, listed you. Are you potentially interested in sponsoring the student? And then that's going to be an important part of this decision that is ultimately going to be made as to whether or not you're offered a spot. Um, and like I said before, you want to check each program's um, application website to see if you qualify for fee waivers. Um, and um, that's, you know, it's an important part of this is, is deciding, um, in some cases, it may be purely financial, deciding which programs and how many programs you can afford to apply to. It's unfortunate. And I, I like I said, I hope that in the future, they, there won't be fees for grad school applications, but most still do have them. And they range from 50 to $100 per school, but many, I don't know about most, but many have fee application uh, or, or fee waivers that you just need to apply for. Um, and then lastly here, who decides which applicants get accepted? And it's both, right? It's both the program's admissions committee, which is usually a group of faculty, and they're more looking at emphasize, emphasis on program fit. How well do you fit in this program? So are your general research interests aligned with this particular program? Um, and then do you have the you know, experience, uh, both in terms of your research experience and your coursework that fits with this program, and you know, have some background of participation in the research community, right? And it doesn't have to be extensive. Many people come straight out of their undergrad and they've just started and that's totally fine, but they're looking you know, for, for some experience. Um, and then there's the other half of this, right? Which is the potential advisors. And those advisors are looking at how well you're gonna fit into their lab. And so do you have those specific research interests? Do you have some of the relevant skills? You don't need to have all of them, but you have some of the relevant skills. Um, and those things should come through in your personal statement and in your CV, right? That those things are listed. If you're applying, you know, to do, you know, subtitle work, that you're a research diver, or that you can, you know, you know, you have these 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 skills, et cetera. Um, ability to work well with other lab members. Obviously, those potential advisors are looking to see how are you going to fit and and are you going to be able to kind of get along because right? that's what obviously they want is the lab to get along. Um, and you want both of these groups, the admissions committee and the potential advisors advisors to say, yes, let's do this. This sounds great. Let's, let's invite this person uh, to come on board. And when they do that, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to say yes, right? That just means that you're going to get an offer and then it's going to be your choice. And hopefully you'll have the burden of choice. Hopefully you'll get into more than one program and then you'll have the problem of deciding between them. Um, but you're not going to get accepted to a program if you don't have a potential advisor saying yeah. to that admissions committee, this you know, person or person saying to this committee, yes, send them an offer. That It just won't happen. The admissions committee won't do that without a potential advisor saying, I want this person. So just again, here's the, the you know, the, um, the uh, timeline here we are. And so we still have some time before these applications are due in December, but you know, it's time to, you know, really start working on these things. Um, and I don't know, Tracy, Becky, you want to add to that before we close here? We're just at about 1.30 exactly. Um, are, are we not doing letters of recommendation today? Yeah, so I, I think somehow we skipped over it um, and we're at time. Do you want to continue now or should we put it into the third um, uh, workshop? I don't know how we skipped it. I don't know. I, I mean, I can stay. I don't know if everybody else can stay just a, like a few minutes. Why don't we do that? And if people need to go, they can go and watch the recording later. But otherwise, if you guys sure. want to hang out, um, Tracy, you're going to talk about uh, getting letters of recommendation, right? 
Yeah, there, there's a whole slide on it. Yeah, I thought there was too. I don't know. Oh, there, there you go. Somehow I just jumped the slide. I don't know how that happened. I, I didn't see it. Did you guys? <laughs> I didn't know. I must have. Anyway, I was just going to say the. For me personally, your grades and your letters of recommendation are the most important outside part of your um, application besides your personal statement. So the question is, who do you ask? Um, and the most important part of that consideration is it's got to be someone that you trust, um, who you know in many different professional capacities and you know is going to write you the best letter possible. If that person hesitates to say yes, that is not a good person to write your letter. Um, this can be a faculty member, an internship provisor, an employer, but usually someone who knows you in a professional capacity. And in this letter, um, they need to speak about your wonderful qualities and why you would make an excellent PhD student. Um, the kinds of things that you want them to hit in the letter, so these are the things you want to show them so they can talk about it, is are you personable? Are you able to work independently? Um, do you play nice in the sandbox? Um, are you motivated, dependable, organized? Are you good at troubleshooting? Um, good at writing, speaking, and what is the future potential to contribute to the field? You know, kind of speaking to your creativeness and forward thinking and ability to push research in the forward direction. So that's the kinds of things that you want to be in your letter. So those are the kinds of things you need to show to these people who will write the letter and trust that they would write the best letter for you possible. So when do you ask? Well, I think as soon as you know you're going to be applying to that graduate program, you let them know. Um, you should share your personal statement with them so that they understand the program you're applying to and what you're wanting to do at that school and who you want to work with. Um, now, this is something people might not realize is most of the time, students do not get to see these letters of recommendation. You will waive your right um, to see it. So there, and the reason is it's supposed to be honest and not influenced by, or hesitating to say things that maybe you would, wouldn't say in front of the student. Now, again, if you have someone you really trust who knows you really well, you shouldn't have any worries about that. Um, but you waive the right so that the letters can be truly honest. Sometimes you get to see them, most of the times you don't. Um, the way that the letters are typically submitted now is they're submitted electronically through university portals. So you will put down um, the faculty member's name, the school contacts them, and then the faculty uploads all the information. Oftentimes with this, it's not just the letter, but often they have us fill out a form ranking you relative to all the other students we've ever worked with. <laughs> um, um, and so, so th those are the kinds of things. Again, make sure you trust the person and make sure it's someone who knows you really well and can speak to all these different traits because that's what a graduate advisor is looking for. Yeah, Tracy, that's great. I would also just add to that that when you ask somebody for a letter of rec, in addition to maybe your draft personal statement, um, include your CV as well, because that'll help them. And then if you are open to it, include you know, your unofficial academic transcripts too, if, if you feel like that's helpful. It's not necessary, but you know they're, they're looking to craft a letter and, and you know all that stuff, but they may not know all of that stuff. And I always appreciate it when I get those things. I actually usually ask for those things. And then the last thing I'll say here, and I know we're over on time, is um, don't be shy to send a reminder. Um, yeah. You know, we, we get flooded and, and it's, it's unfortunate that that's the situation, but I, I honestly, I'll probably get, you know, between 50 and hundred emails a day and it's really easy to get behind. And it, I really appreciate it when somebody says, oh, hey, did you have a chance, you know, to send in that letter of recommendation? It's due in two weeks. Uh, I, that's great. That's exactly what I want. And, and, and um, so don't be shy to send a gentle reminder or two until that person confirms or like Tracy is saying, these university portals, they're actually usually going to send you an automatic 
recently generated an email that says Dr. So-and-so has submitted your letter or recommendation. So you know that. I, when I get those, I usually try and forward them to the student just to make sure that they know that it's done so that they, they can relax and they don't have to worry about you know me still. Yeah. Um, anyhow, I know we're over on time. You can also send them your letter, your uh, personal statement too, if you have it written. That's helpful for me. And I was just going to say one, one last thing because, and I've only done this once, is sometimes in the recommendation letter, you want the recommender to talk about, maybe explain something on your record that you wouldn't necessarily talk about in your personal statement. So I had a student who had been, I think, in an abusive relationship or relationships when they were an undergrad, and it affected their transcript. Um, and she asked me to speak about it. Um, in her um, letter of recommendation and then talk about how when she changed schools and her personal situation improved, how she really blossomed as a student. So if you do have those things that have happened to you, um, people can speak about it on your behalf to help explain the situation and maybe how um, things have improved or what you learned from those, those experiences. Yeah. Um, I'll just no note and add to that, that if it's at the school that you're at now and you bring those things up, know that the person, if it's at UH Hilo, that they're a mandatory reporter and they have to turn that information over to the Title IX coordinator as well, right? So it, I think it's one thing if it's from somewhere else, but if it's happening at UH Hilo um, that, and you're asking for a letter from somebody at UH Hilo, um, just know that, that, that those faculty are mandatory reporters. Yeah, I don't think I used the word abusive. I said it was in a difficult personal situation or something oh, okay, like that. Okay. And it was also before we had more explicit rules about how to handle these situations, so. Yeah, um, tough to finish on, on that note, but that, that's really um, you know, important to, to, to think about. And I'm glad that we talked about it. We threw a lot at you and I'm sorry that it was, you know, it was kind of so much just us talking and not enough opportunity for you guys to talk and share. Um, but we wanted to cover all that information. Um, we'll upload this as a video link um, next week. And so that'll be available if you want to go back and say, oh, well, you know, what about this or that? And look at that slide again. And I'm going to um, try and get together a Lima site for us to put these slides and other resources um, together in one shared place. And I'll try and get that done uh, as soon as I can. Um, otherwise, thank you guys very much. Um, and uh, remember, you know, find a, a good uh, mentor who can help you, particularly somebody who's in a PhD program now that like just went through it, are, are really good people that can really help out. Otherwise, stay safe and look for the email about the next and final workshop that um, hopefully you'll have a chance to attend. And thank you guys very much for being here and for your interest. Yeah, thank you all of you. Thank you. And have a good weekend, everybody. Yeah. Thanks so much for putting this together, guys. This is awesome. Thanks, guys. Of course.